Hello and welcome to the fifth annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I'm Leah Langby from the Indian Head Federated Library System and helping me moderate the Youth Services track today is Joy Schwartz from the Winifox Library System. I'm glad you're all able to listen in this afternoon. Our presenter for this session is Laura Koenig with the Boston Public Library and she will be discussing designing spaces for service and um, she will be taking questions at the end, so be sure to type them into the question area and we will get to them as many as possible at the end. Take it away, Laura. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to talk about our process as we transformed spaces and services here at the Boston Public Library. Um, as Oh, my slides aren't advancing. <laughs> um, as Leah mentioned, my name is Laura Koenig. I'm the head of Central Children's Services at the Boston Public Library. And I came on just as this process of transforming our spaces, of renovating our children's and teen spaces began as the head of uh, children's services here at the, at the library. I had been at the BPL for several years before that. So I got to be a part of this really incredible process, and I'm excited to tell you about it today. Before I jump in, I do want to emphasize that I recognize that we had a lot of resources here at the BPL, and that not everyone is going to have access to the resources that we have, but that the process that we went through, I think, can be useful to anyone, whether you are starting on a renovation or whether you're just looking at your own spaces and services and thinking about ways that you can make changes within the spaces you already have. I think it really is ultimately about the process. So I do want to, uh, to acknowledge that while I, I am so excited about the wonderful things I'm going to share with you, I think there are ways to scale them to different spaces. And first, I want to show you a little bit about what things looked like at the BPL before we started this renovation process. And I'm going to warn you now that it's grim. So here is a look at the Central Library um, at the Johnson Building, which was built in the 1970s, is a brutalist structure. And you can't see from this picture, but when you first walked in the front door of the Johnson Building, what you saw was not people or books. What you saw was granite and maybe a security guard or two. It felt like a fortress that was designed to keep you away from services and books. And that was one of the reasons that we started this really essential renovation process. And it was not just the adult spaces that felt grim and uninviting. It was also the children's spaces. Um, so the former children's room had been, it had been the children's room since this um, space opened in the 1970s. And even though it was designed as a space for children, it never felt like a space that was designed as for children's use. It really did feel like an adult space that had a couple of stuffed animals and toys thrown into it. Um, you can see that large couch there was put in uh, only maybe five years before the renovation as sort of a the only comfortable seating in the building at that space. So that was the first sort of step in that transformation. But beyond it not feel sort of that warm, welcoming, inviting feeling that we wanted from it. We also didn't have programming spaces. Um, we would shove programs sort of into corners. So this is sort of in the middle of the room. Where Maggie is trying to lead a book group um, and doing her best to do so. But it was not just the spaces that really needed to uh, be looked at. So you can see Maggie leading a book group here or here working on a story time. Maggie came in at the Central Library about a year, year and a half before I did, and when Maggie came to the Central Library at the BPL, um, it was not being considered a neighborhood library. So librarians were not doing librarian-led programming. Uh, they would bring in people to do, outside performers to do a sing-along. They would show movies, but there was nothing to directly engage the community because the feeling was that we weren't a neighborhood library and we should only do large-scale things and we should not be directly engaging with the immediate community. And um, Maggie, when she came in, uh, really wanted to start transforming the ways that we looked at services. Um, and when I came into the Central Library, I absolutely agreed with her that while, yes, we are a central location, we are also a neighborhood library for many people. And the services that we were providing were we're not, um, we're not working for anyone, either the many, many visitors that we get at the BPL, the people who are visiting from all around the state and the country, or our immediate, um, our immediate patrons in the neighborhood. So I'm first going to dig in to talk a little bit about spaces, the questions we were asking as we started designing the spaces and how we uh, chose to transform those spaces. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the programming and services and how we, the questions we asked about how we would transform programs and services. 
So first, a couple of things. When we started really brainstorming about what we would like to see in our spaces at the BPL for children, we wanted the spaces to be accessible. We wanted them to be a destination, a place that people would want to come again and again. And as the central library at the Boston Public Library, it should be a place that felt sort of like a palace to children's books, a place where everyone would feel like they wanted to be. We wanted it to be age specific, to have um, to really be thinking and focusing on different ages. We wanted it to be engaging for children of all those ages, a journey, a playful space, a place that sort of had that whimsy that the previous space didn't, a space that inspired a love of reading and a love of learning, and ultimately a space that had a wow factor. But what did all of that mean? So we started thinking about what questions might lead us to this as, um, as, as we designed. And one of the questions that we asked was, what should our spaces do for patrons? What is unique about our library specifically? How do we embrace our history? We have a deep history here in Boston, and particularly at the BPL. We did have the first children's room. Uh, I mean, some people say the first children's room in the country. That's maybe not entirely true, but one of them certainly. And how do we promote its future? And what activities do we want children to engage in while they're at the library? So let's see how we approached a couple of those questions. Uh, first, in terms of what our spaces should do for patrons, I talked earlier a little bit about that sort of journey and it being age-specific. So one of the decisions we made fairly early on is that we wanted the space to grow with age. You can see here a little sort of map of what the spaces would ultimately look like. And I do want to say that um, I came into the process when these, the sort of big lines outside the children's and teen rooms were there, but what was inside the furniture and the design had not happened. So this is kind of where I started when I came into the BPL. And you can see that the children's library is about double the size that it was previously. And we started with the space for the youngest children down at the end. So as you came into the library, um, this was very close to the front doors, which you, you might be able to tell are closest to that large hall in the middle. Um, so this, this is Toddle Town, and this is a space that was designed for our youngest children. It was designed to have really experiential play in mind, this time when children are developing their brains and getting ready to read and learn by experiencing the world around them and by using their senses in very different ways. Um, so Toddle Town wanted to focus on that. I also want to mention that our collections were designed to grow with these spaces as well. So things like board books and concept books are down here in Toddle Town for the youngest children. The next space we looked at was uh, the Storyscape, which was designed to move children from that experiential play when they're primarily experiencing the world around them to imaginative play, where they are telling their own stories. And we wanted this space to really be, have that whimsical feeling that would engage them in storytelling. Um, after that, we started um, introducing technology into the space, and we very intentionally did not want to have technology um, immediately in the spaces that were designed for the youngest children. And we did also want it to be introduced in a way that would make the most sense. So the computers that are closest to that um, the Storyscape area are our AWE early literacy computers, so that it is sort of a, a way for kids to move toward the computers before they get to the standard ones. This is also where the easy and early chapter books start coming in. So again, we tried to have those very intentionally closer to the children who would use them most. And then you get into the main collections and the tween space down at the end. One of the things that we really wanted to do with the tween space is to have some real separation between that space and the space for the younger children. We see a lot of very young children here at the Central Library. Um, it gets chaotic, it gets loud, and we did get a lot of response from older children and from tweens who were coming in that one of the things they wanted was the ability to sort of focus to read a book or to do their homework without feeling like babies were absolutely all around them. So that's the reason that we put a large amount of the collections in between those spaces to give them some separation, to give them a space that felt a little bit more like their own. Um, the other thing to note about the tween space is that it is the space that's closest to the teen room, which is that other area up in the corner that you can see. Um, so we did want it to feel sort of like a bridge between those spaces. And then the final space that we had here was our program room, which was really just designed to be open for all ages and flexible and um, able to be used for a lot of different purposes. The next question that we thought about was sort of what was unique about our library, and what we really wanted to do is to celebrate Boston and the fact that this was an urban city and a city with a lot of history. 
So we started thinking about some of the things that made this a special city. Uh, the Make Way for Duckling statue was an immediate obvious connection to children's literature. The swan boats in the public garden, the aquarium, and the fact that we are a city on the ocean. Uh, we thought a lot about transportation as well, since that's something, as a lot of you who work with kids know, they like to talk about and think about. One of the other questions that we had thought about was how we embrace our history and promote it, promote the future of the space, and we thought that storytelling was a great way to do that. So we knew that we wanted to sort of incorporate the local history of storytelling, the really vibrant authors who were in the area and the stories that had been set in the area. We weren't sure exactly what that would look like, but it started with a list. So we put together a list of some books that were either written in the New England area or were set in the New England area. We um, had them arranged by ages, and we were very specific about making sure that this list was diverse. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had people of color represented, authors of color, um, characters of color, and also as women as well as men in shown on this list, and that did lead to some unexpected choices, which I think has been really fun. When I show you what we did with this list, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the fun that that led to. And the other question that we had about sort of the design piece was what activities do we want to promote for children and teens in the library? And we talked a lot about Every Child Ready to Read, the talk, sing, read, write, play, but we did want it to feel like something that wasn't just for young children, so what we ended up focusing on was read, play, learn, where we were sort of taking some of those elements from Every Child Ready to to read, but also adding in that learn so that it, it was something that um, applied to all of the children using the space. And the way that we did that, thought started thinking about that question was going to other places and looking at other places that had created really playful engagement in their spaces, um, spaces that invited play, spaces that invited learning and um, invited reading. You can see some of those reading nooks that we looked at. Um, we looked at some interactive features in museums and other libraries. And we also looked at sensory rooms designed for children on the autism spectrum or children with sensory processing disorders. So those were some objectives that we had for our spaces. Then we came to the point where we had to transform them. We had to take these objectives, these big picture things we had been talking and thinking about for some time, and say, how do we make these into an actual space? And we found that this was the hardest part. So there were four people from the library itself who were on a team that met with the architects and designers who were working on the space. And I want to emphasize that our architects and designers were awesome, but were not people who traditionally had designed for children. Um, they had designed some libraries before and those had had children's spaces in them, but they were not coming at it from a child-focused perspective. And I really was excited to be on this team because I, I thought that I could bring a perspective of someone who is working directly with children, knows what is happening in a children's room every day, and knows how vibrant that space can be and what, what that space might be. So let's take a look at some of what that transformation from those ideas into actual spaces looked like. So there's a picture of the entrance to our children's library today. Um, I do think it's a wonderful, vibrant space. And one of the first pieces that came to us as we started thinking about those big ideas and saying, what should they look like? So I mentioned that transportation map and how so many kids are excited about those maps. Um, so one of the first things that came to us was sort of creating a journey through the space that was uh, made with actual physical paths in the library. Um, we do, as you can see, we sort of color-coded all of those separate sections that I just told you a little bit about. So green over there in the uh, Toddletown Early Literacy space. And as you come into the front door, there are lines on the floor that will lead you to each of those spaces. They're both a great finding aid, and kids get really, even older kids will say, like, all right, we're going to explore the library, and we're going to do it by walking on the blue line first, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to walk on the orange line next. Uh, but young children also use them to develop motor skills, which has been really fun to watch. They do also have some paths that go through the stacks themselves, particularly the orange line takes you through quite a bit of the stacks and collections, which both is a really fun moment. Um, these are a little bit low for adults to go through, so it does feel like a special kids moment, but also creates some fun little hidey holes for kids to sit in and read, and that was, as you might, have, might remember, one of our intentions as well was to have sort of child-sized reading spaces. I just, this might take a minute to load, just want to show you one of our friends running on through those stacks. Um, they, the kids are always delighted to find that little moment, that sort of surprise of getting to go through. 
one of the other elements that came to us fairly early was the pathway to reading our sensory wall. So we had talked a lot about sort of making sure that the space was welcoming to children on the autism spectrum and welcoming to kids with sensory processing issues. Um, and we had considered, so there is a library in Great Britain, I think in Leeds, I'm forgetting exactly which city at this moment, that has its own sensory room. Um, if you're not familiar with sensory rooms, they are spaces that are usually dim, usually quiet, and have places where kids can sort of engage with different sensory experiences at their own pace. It's self-directed. And a lot of those sort of sensory experiences are things like bubble tubes, things like LED, um, LED lights. Um, so they're really amazing spaces. And one of the reasons that we decided to move forward with this in our early literacy space is that we did want to say we want this space to be welcoming. And when we're talking to, uh, to families with autistic children, we want to make sure that we're saying to them, we had you in mind. But we also want to be very clear that we were not designing this as a therapeutic space. Um, that is not ultimately the library's intention. I think it's really cool that, that the one library in Great Britain did make that actual therapeutic space. Um, along with people who, who actually do, um, doctors who work with, with kids with autism. That, that was not ultimately the intention with that space, but we did want it to feel welcoming, to be a way to reach out to families and say your needs were in mind when we were thinking about our spaces. But also because many of the things that you find in those, in those sensory rooms are also terrific for very young children who are developing their little brains. Um, so you can see a little one right there engaging with that bubble tube. And you'll see, you also see in this pathway to reading sensory wall, a lot of those manipulative panels that you see in a lot of libraries that help kids gain fine and gross motor skills. But we wanted them also to be getting that sort of visual tactile stimuli from other sensory experiences. This is a space, and I want to emphasize that this is true for a lot of the really interesting things that are in here. While the major renovation was funded by the city, which is awesome, and we're so thankful about that, um, a lot of these special pieces were funded by specific donors. So we went to a donor with this idea for the Pathway to Reading Sensory Wall and said, this is something that will engage the community in a different way than we've done before. Um, this is something that is reaching out to several different, um, different populations. And a donor said, yes, absolutely, we would love to help you build this. So I do want to emphasize that not all of these resources now necessarily came from our city government, that there are ways, especially when you're talking about something really fun like this, uh, to, to look for other ways to make these things happen. Um, and as I mentioned, as we were putting this together, we wanted to make sure that we were engaging not just um, motor skills, but also having visual interactives, auditory panels with some sound, a lot of tactile um, pieces for kids to play with. Um, this space has been one of the most popular things that we have in the library. It is in constant use. And one of the things that we love about it is that those panels, um, the square ones, not, the, not anything that has plugs, um, can be transferred out so that we can create different sensory experiences for kids who come in the library. So we can pull one of those out and replace it with a different one every month or two months so that as kids grow, they have new sensory experiences waiting for them when they come into the library. We also, with this space, really wanted to focus on caregiver interaction. Um, so we, we have spent a lot of time um, modeling, having librarians model ways to use the space with a child and talk uh, with a child while using the space, which, as we all know, as children's librarians, talking with a caregiver is one of the primary ways that kids learn and get those words going. Um, so we, are, we do a lot of modeling, and we do some specific programming that encourages um, librarian and caregiver interactions around this. So we do some play groups in the space during our most popular times. On Friday mornings, we have our sing-alongs, and we get hundreds of people in the door and because there, we, there's too many people to go in our program space, we do a couple ticketed programs. And while people are waiting, we do a play group in this space. We bring out some, um, some toys for kids to use that are special for that time. And our early literacy librarian and sometimes other librarians, depending on how busy it is, hang out here in this Pathway to Reading Sensory Wall space and do some modeling about how... Um, talking to parents about how to use the space. We also really love bringing in, and I'm kind of getting into programming here, but this is the place to talk about this, um, really love bringing in some of the other local organizations that work on early literacy during this time. So we'll sometimes set up a table in a corner where somebody from WIC, from the Women with 
infants and children's health centers can come by and talk about their programs, or someone from the Children's Museum can come by and talk about some of the special programming that they, they do for young kids. So we, we work hard to, during that time, make sure that we're engaging families in different ways and engaging caregivers. We also did design um, a little bit about that tells caregivers about why it's important, why all of the different, um, different sensory activities kids are getting in this area are important. So we, we did also put together some, some special ways that caregivers can learn about it, even if they don't want to interact with librarians, which we understand that, of course, uh, some people just want to be engaging in the space on their own. One of the other things that was very important to our process was making sure that we were getting input and engagement from patrons as we were making these changes. Um, and I did a couple of focus groups with families who used the space, and I just want to talk about one of the things that came out of those focus groups, um, because I think they really were an important part of our process, was hearing from patrons directly. And this was an idea that I don't think uh, I ever would have come up with on my own. I was in a focus group uh, talking particularly to families that have very young children. So we were talking especially about that area for, for the youngest kids. And one of the nannies in the group said, you know, when I'm here with a baby, um, that baby is often lying in my lap or lying on the couch or lying in the stroller, and they don't necessarily see all the stuff that's all around them that might be really cool. What they see is the ceiling. Is there anything on your ceiling? And I went back to the, the group that was doing the design and said, I think this is pretty valid that um, it's true that sometimes a kid is not necessarily looking at the walls and the cool things that we put there, or looking at the toys in front of them. They are laying on their back and staring straight up, so what can we do? Um, and we had found these light fixtures that looked like looked like uh, books that were flying, and we liked them a lot, but we didn't need additional light fixtures, so we, we ended up um, building these sculptural pieces that we call the book birds that are in flocks throughout the room, and they've been, patrons have responded really well, and, um, and we've really enjoyed that those came directly from feedback from patrons. I think that was one of my favorite moments was just hearing this is a need we have and saying, all right, we can address those needs. Um, we also talked quite a bit about Boston and particularly Boston's history, and we wanted to make sure that the history of the library um, was reflected in the children's room as well, but we didn't want it to be something boring. We wanted it to be something then kids would enjoy. Um, so this is a picture that's in the McKim building in our old, um, our old section of the library that was built in the 1890s by Charles Follett McKim. Um, one of the things that kids tend to engage in there with is not the John Singer Sargent murals or those other beautiful but very sort of vaunted things, but these lions. Um, there are two lion statues in the McKim building. And of course, there are also connections to lions and libraries throughout culture. You've got your New York Public Library lions and um, Library Lion, the book, and uh, the TV show Between the Lions. So we thought that would be a fun moment to bring, uh, bring a piece of history into the children's room. So we decided to make our lion cubs. Uh, we have three cubs through the room. They are, um, so they, you can see that he's white right now, this little guy, but they can light up from the inside. And part of what we were excited about in that light up is that we could then make them interactive. So let's see if you can see our friends here. Again, it probably will take a second to load. I love these guys, they're so cute. Um, so we can set them in different ways. We can set them to just rotate through colors. We can set them to be interactive in these ways where either if children approach them from the front or if they run under these tunnels that they're set under, that it has an interactive element. Um, the other thing that we really wanted to be cognizant of is making sure that, this, that children felt some ownership of the space, particularly the kids who were there during the sort of transformation and who went through some tough times while we were shoving services into small spaces that could not handle them. Um, so one of the things that we did to address that was a naming contest for our lion cubs um, where kids could write a letter to the lion cubs and talk about why they should have the names that they gave them. Our winning names, Leon, Cubby, and Dandelion. And there's a, a special ceremony we had with the president of the library and the kids who named our little lions. Um, I mentioned that storytelling and sort of was part of our goals in terms of bringing New England into the space and that list of uh, names of books that I put up a little bit earlier. We really wanted to celebrate those books and New England in stories and New England authors. So we ended up in our design of the, um, of the walls, including in the, in the graphics, 
a bunch of those titles. So you can see in those graphics that we have that sort of read, play, learn piece in there. Um, you've got it, the learn on the sitgo sign. We also incorporated a lot of elements of Boston into those graphics. So you can see that, that learn sitgo sign or the Prudential Center there. If you know Boston well, you might recognize these things. And then we incorporated these New England-based authors and stories. One of the really fun and special things about this, and I mentioned that there are a couple of um, titles on the wall that are lesser known. Um, one of them, Seaside Dreams by Janet Costa Bates. It was her first picture book, and she came into the library not long after we opened, and I got the chance to say, come over here, I want to show you something. And that was a really special moment. Um, another I see right in front of us, <coughs> excuse me, Joey Pigs as well, the key is up on there. And it, some of you may know that Jack Gantos wrote many of his books in the Boston Public Library and still sometimes does. So that was also a special moment. Uh, Jack came on the first day, and I have a picture of him pointing up at that little Joey Pigs as well, the key on the wall. So that's been a really special way to both make that connection to storytelling in New England, but also really encourage our connection with some of the, the people who are still writing here in New England. We, of course, especially wanted to address uh, Make Way for Ducklings, which is such a huge part of Boston's uh, children's book history. So in that early literacy space, our theme was the public garden here in Boston. You can see the swan boats, and you can see Mama Duck and the little ducklings um, up there above part of the sensory wall. But also, next to the ducklings, the piles of books are Make Way for Ducklings, the title in the languages that are most spoken in Boston, because we, of course, did want to acknowledge, again, the urbanness of the city, the fact that we have many populations who are here, and we wanted them, to, everyone to feel welcome and like they were part of this space. Um, the storyscape was the, the space that we talked about where it's really about imaginative play. And this is a space where we did some sort of build-outs of um, these, you can see those brightly colored buildings in the back that are designed to look a little bit like some of the brownstones that you'd see in downtown Boston, but whimsical and fun. And throughout the space, you may have noticed there's that sort of follow the line. Um, it's an echo of the follow the line picture books. You can follow that line through the space and you can see it peeking out in different places there in front of us. You can see it making some little flower pots in a window. Um, it makes little lions in several places as part of our lion theme going through the space. So this space was about imaginative play and one of the things that we especially wanted to focus on in, uh, in the storyscape area was making sure that kids could walk into the storyscape and feel like they could be telling a story. So sometimes you'll have kids walk up to the doors and windows in the space and knock on a door. I'll go up and say, who's in there? And when the little girl says, it's the witch, that's what I know, that things are going OK. And kids are using the space in the ways that we'd hoped and using their imaginations and telling stories, which is so exciting. Um, another thing that we did to make sure that that space did engage that sort of storytelling imaginative play piece was um, include costumes, especially costumes that might be um, that might be things that people that you would find in a city throughout that space, so kids can just pop in and start playing um, in in that city focused space, and also puppets and puppet theaters. So we get a lot of great storytelling and a lot of kids engaging with each other. It's a way that kids often meet new friends or maybe uh, tell a story to some friends that they have just met some younger kids. And as I mentioned, we especially wanted spaces for reading. And one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was making sure that there were spaces for families to engage in reading as a together activity. So we have a lot of larger seating throughout the space. This is the biggest one. This is our story chair. We do do some story times in here sometimes, although most of our programming is in the, uh, is in the program room. I do my story times here because I love this chair so much. Um, it's a, a time and a half huge chair. Um, you see whole families sitting there and engaging in a book together. or you you see little ones just sitting on a corner with their fancy Nancy book. And then the final space down on the end was the bridge for the tweens. I did mention that one of the things we heard from our older kids was that they really wanted it to feel like a separate space. So, And what they didn't want, they when we talked to our kids who were coming in, they didn't want that sort of interactive engagement piece. They didn't want um, a play space. What they wanted was a space to work on their homework, a space to read, um, and a space that was a little bit further away from the smaller children who were there. So we tried to listen. Like this, I, I sometimes feel a little bit like our tween space did not meet what I would like of it when I look at places like Toronto is putting together some tween spaces that have these huge interactive cool features and that I'm jealous of, but I, I think I need to pull back at those moments and recognize that the reasons that we made these decisions were because we listened to our patrons and to our young people 
people and that that's important and that the way that this space is used is kids curling up in corners and reading or kids are homework helpers sit here after school and kids um, really engaging directly and that is what they told us they wanted to do and that is how we've seen they're using the space so that's great. And then our final piece is the program room down at the end. Um, you can see a young person there following that blue line, which goes out onto the door where George is sitting. Uh, Margaret and H.A. Ray did give money for our previous children's room, and so our, in honor of them, our program room is named after the Rays. Um, that space was designed to be very flexible um, so that you can have tables up or chairs um, and that you can open that those doors all the way up so that, say, when Kate DiCamillo came to the library before our big auditorium was finished, we could put her in there and have chairs coming all the way out into the children's room. So we appreciate the flexibility of that space. That's really what it was designed for. So that's a little bit about the design piece. Now I want to talk a little bit about how that wow factor went into how we thought about programming and services as we moved into the new space. Because as I said, it was not just the space that uh, had a lot of needs that needed something new. It was definitely the programming. So we first wanted to look at where the gaps were in the library's programming for children and how we could fill those gaps. We wanted to think about how we could work with community partners to bring special cultural events to the library. Now, some kids cannot go to the ballet, we, but we have the ballet here, so what can we do to bring those things to a space where kids can go? Is our children's programming in line with the library's compass principles? This was a few years before the design. The library went through a sort of a major, um, a major initiative to look at what our major principles were, and we wanted to make sure that we were considering those. One of them is fun, so we always know that our programming is hitting at least one. Um, and how can we meet the early literacy needs of our community? I think I mentioned earlier that we see a huge number of very young children at the Central Library. That is, our primary audience is little guys, so we wanted to think long and hard about how we were meeting early literacy needs. Um, in terms of early literacy, our transformation has really been about thinking about the ways that we're doing. So I mentioned earlier that it did feel like it was all outside performers, like there was no direct engagement between librarians and the community in our programs. And, but it also felt very haphazard. Things would happen at random times. People didn't necessarily know they could come at a specific time and have programming. So one of the things that we did was institute programming. It, so things can change on Monday mornings. It might not be the same thing, but people will know if they come on a Monday morning that the program there will be appropriate for two to four year olds. Even if we change it, even if we don't have our usual toddler time and then explore and play, um, explore and play time after toddler time, that it's going to be for two to four year olds. And we also don't take programming breaks. And I recognize, again, I want to make sure that I'm acknowledging that we are in a special position. We did add quite a bit of staffing when we opened this library. We also expanded hours and expanded programming enormously. So we absolutely need that staffing, but we do have the ability to not take program breaks because we have so many people and we are able to sort of sub in. Um, we do try to make sure that even though um, patrons know that certain people typically do many of the programs, that they also acknowledge that other people might sometimes be there and that everyone is part of this children's team and that we're all there to serve their needs. So one of the things that really has made our um, early literacy program go well is that knowledge to people as they come in that things will be there for them. We have had just an incredible explosion of people coming in for early literacy programming. Uh, we cannot do enough to keep up with the need, um, which is something we're still working on. We have added more and more. We've added more sessions. Um, we've started having to ticket programs, first come, first serve, uh, because we do get a lot of tourists and people coming in. We prefer not to do sign-ups ahead of time. I know that's often a question people have when programs are large. Um, because we do work with a lot of tourists and folks who are here just for a month, um, we try to keep it first come, first serve. Um, but we have also tried to listen to patrons about what their wants and needs are. So we heard a lot from patrons that while we did a lot of programming um, that addressed the kids' needs, what they weren't hearing was things that addressed the sort of parent and caregiver needs, particularly for a new mom who might feel a little bit overwhelmed in the library is one of the first places that they turn for information. Um, so we started adding quite a bit more programming that brought in outside experts to talk about parenting um, and also we also added programming that brought in library resources about 
how to raise children. And so that might not even be led by a children's librarian. We have, for example, had somebody from our research services department come in to talk about Mango Languages and the Mango Languages piece, um, I forget what it's called, Lil Pim with the panda bear, um, to do an introduction to that while at the same time um, a children's librarian is leading a play group on the other side of the room so that parents and caregivers can come feel like they are able to get information um, but still be able to engage with their child and not feel like they're not welcome at some of the sort of library spaces, um, library information pieces because they have a small child with them. That was part of the feedback we got. It's like, I can't go to the technology classes. I have a two-year-old and I'm with my two-year-old all day. So we started trying to bring some of those things into the library as well and we've gotten great feedback about that. I also talked about some of the gaps in service. That was one of our questions and one of the gaps that we found particularly is that we were not offering bilingual programming. So we have worked with several organizations. Uh, we are the closest library to Chinatown, so we particularly wanted to make sure that we were reaching the populations in Chinatown. We did a lot of talking to people who were coming in to see what they wanted and a lot of it was um, for school age children. Um, they were looking for for, um, for school preparation. So we did a Math 101 program that was very popular for some time. We have done a lot about sort of test preparation because that's what we were hearing from parents and caregivers was what's wanted. It wasn't necessarily what the librarians most wanted to do, but we are doing our best to do some listening. But it also meant that we brought in um, some really fun folks to do bilingual programming with us here. You can see a Spanish language bilingual um, circle story time happening. One of the other gaps that we were looking at was um, reaching out to the community who who have children with autism and doing sensory story times as many libraries are doing was the first thing that we did there but at this point we have um, gone mostly to an outreach model we have found that while we did get people coming in um, it's this is a bustling difficult place for a lot of children who might have uh, who might have sensory processing disorders we're looking at other options of ways to get people in and feel like they're welcome but we have also recognized that outreach needs to, is a necessary part of that so we're working with with some organizations and making sure that we're also taking things to them. So that was part of what we've learned is that uh, we, even though we do have this amazing space and we want everyone to be welcome and we are working with communities to make sure that they feel welcome and that we can find ways to get folks into the space, we also need to make sure we're outside of our doors, which of course is so important to everyone. STEM and STEAM were, of course, ultimately um, some of the things that we especially wanted to bring in. And it could be as simple as a Lego club, which these young people are engaging in. Um, we did buy some dot and dash programming robots, which again were grant funded. So we're, um, we were able to um, use the Highland Foundations Technology Grant, which is a local organization. So sometimes there are folks who can help you uh, find what you can bring in. But we also just added a lot of librarian-led um, fun things like our Tinker Tots Tuesday morning story times, where we'll do a story time based on a STEM-ish theme for three to five-year-olds, and then have uh, station-based activities for children and caregivers to explore together. That's the one, so I, I manage the space, so I mostly don't get to do a lot of programming, but that's the one that I kept for myself because I love it so much. We also wanted to work hard to make sure that we were engaging with that author community that I mentioned since New England has such a strong community of people who are writing and illustrating children's books. There you can see Megan Dowd Lambert and David Ezra Stein hanging out with some kids, doing some reading and doing some drawing. Uh, we work with the Boston Book Festival every year to bring in storytellers and authors, um, but also do things during the year. We really wanted to emphasize creation in our programs, and I know this is something that a lot of libraries are thinking about, is having our programs not just be, uh, not be, be really process-based, be things that kids are creating on their own. Um, so there I think you can see some kids working on some graphic novels. And we especially wanted to make sure that we were taking advantage of community resources. So I mentioned earlier, sort of some kids might not be able to go to the ballet. How can we get the ballet in? Um, so we've started doing story times where we'll uh, read a story that's based on the Nutcracker, have someone from the ballet come in, show some costumes so that kids can get a can feel and get some idea of how they go and do a very brief um, dance class with some of our the ballet dancers who are local. We have some amazing museums, so we've worked with the um, 
with the local aquarium and we had their, they have a, an internship program for teenagers who are working on education in the museum. So they agreed to come in once a month and again these, these things are done for free by community organizations because they want to be engaging and many of these organizations have community outreach people. Um, they come in once a month and bring in some little like special tide pool animals and do uh, programming that's around conservation and talking to kids about seasides and conservation which is both a way to sort of engage with our New England heritage and the sea that's here, um, but also a really fun thing for our kids to do once a month, and that is a great opportunity for those teens, too, who are working at the aquarium. Um, what you see in front of you is the library started a, um, a composer-in-residence program in the last year, and it is, it's not a program that's meant for kids, but we went to Bo, the composer-in-residence, and said, hey, I hear that you used to work at a school. Do you want to make some music with children? And Bo said, yes, and has been doing really fun things with us since then. So sort of finding those resources in the community that might not even be engaged towards children. But Bo not only brought himself in, but also brought uh, Katrina Goldsaito and Julie, oh, Julie Kuao, I might be getting her last name wrong, the author and illustrator of The Sound of Silence, to do a program based on that book where uh, they had children doing multimedia art. So we've been very lucky to be able to work with some of those community organizations. So those are some of the sort of big picture, and I'm not going to dig too much in because I want to leave some time for questions, but just to give you an idea of what our process was, how we started asking questions, and um, how we started moving from that really moribund service model that we had before to having uh, about 100 programs a month and uh, usually about... 5,000 people attending programs a month. That is, over two years, we went from a time when there were probably about three programs a week at the Central Library to now when there are about 100 programs a month. Um, it has been a learning curve for all of us. It has been really exciting and wonderful. We were down two staff members for a good part of that time, so it has been exhausting. But the patron feedback has been phenomenal, and now that we are finally, thankfully, fully staffed, um, we've been having a really amazing time sort of listening to what our community wants and needs and finding ways to, uh, to try and bring that to them. The other thing that we always, always want to make sure of is that even if people aren't there to engage in the things that those specific things, what we want them to do is let them know that the space is theirs, let them know that it's their own and that they can be engaging in the Boston Public Library in whatever way they feel like is best for them and that we are delighted to have everyone here with them. So I would love, Leah, to answer some questions for the last 20 minutes or so. I think we've still got a little time if there have been questions coming in. Great. We do have some questions and please keep typing them in as you uh, think of them. Um, also, just if you have ideas about ways that you are um, doing some of this stuff, what you know, using the people in your community, or if you if this has sparked any ideas of things that you want to try in your library, um, please let us know about that too. Um, let's see, what vendors did you use for your comfortable seating? Uh, so it was a variety of vendors, and um, if there are any specific ones that you saw or are interested in, please feel free. My email is on there. I don't have the full list in front of me right now. Um, I know that that big story time chair was custom built for us, um, but I can definitely find the vendor for, for folks, and I can maybe even send some of that information to Leah for, um, for the specifics. It is all, so we, um, the, Boston has very strict fire codes, so it is pretty much all specifically library vendors for our furniture. Excellent. Okay, well, we had some, um, let me just see here. Um, some other people, someone used donations, K, they used donations to hire a local artist who did three murals in their library. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, local landscapes and school mascots. Oh, I think um, it's great when you can find those, particularly people in your community who want to support the library. I mean, those people are there, I think, in every community, and the scale might be different. I and mean, we, I'm very lucky to be in Boston and in a space where the scale might be, we're going to build you this really cool, huge sensory wall. Um, but even if the scale is bringing a couple of manipulatives in for your space, um, I think there are people there who are excited to support libraries. Um, but being able especially to make those connections with an artist and then have kids sort of talk about 
that person being in their community and that now something is on the wall and what kind of what can you where can you lead kids from there um, I think there are a lot of opportunities with that so that's great to hear yeah um, and then someone Lisa saying we work with a lot with first responders in their town Oh, that's terrific. I think that's a great idea. Um, I knew we're not able to do this in my library. We're on the second floor, and we don't we have no parking. We're in a very busy place, but I knew a librarian who would have sort of the not just fire trucks pull up right outside, but also garbage trucks pull up right outside. Um, they do a garbage truck themed story time and then have the garbage truck pull up. And the kids went crazy over that. Um, and honestly, one of the most fun, so the second floor was finished about a year before the rest of the library was finished. So kids were kind of coming in through this construction area. And we would be in the program room. We have these huge windows on all sides. And there would be these cool construction trucks right outside. So you're sort of trying to do tinker tots or whatever it is. But it becomes like, look at the trucks. All right, let's talk about <laughs> what they're doing. And that's, again, that's just another way to sort of engage with the world that's around you, which um, I think always has to be part of what we're doing. Excellent. Um, someone asked uh, if you have, do you have self-check out stations in your children's space? We do have self-checks in the children's room itself. Um, we are a library that has two separate unions for librarians and um, circulation staff. And so we cannot, the librarians in the central library are not able to actually do check out and check in. Um, but because we have those self-checks there, we are still able to help people sort of get things ready and kids of course also love being able to do it themselves so we actually did have our self checks put onto tables that can be raised and lowered to different heights they sadly don't lower as low as we would like them to like they're not quite at toddler level but it does let school age kids um, because of this this table that raises and lowers it does let kids feel like it's on their level and like they can like it's there for them and they can do it themselves. So we love having the self-checks there, both so that we can help people and make sure they're ready to go, and also um, because kids want to do want to do it and want to play with those. Cool. Um, then I'm just seeing here. Okay, someone Lisa is saying we have a lot of artists here in our town. What a great idea to have them add to the decor. Yeah, um, I think I think it can be really wonderful I mean and you can even you can engage kids in that piece I honestly wish one of the things when I think back on our process that I wish I had been able to do more and as I said I came into um, I came into this job right as the process was getting started and really felt like I was getting my feet under me as it was going I think if I were at this point in my career a couple years later um, I would have more been able to voice that I think this is important but engaging kids directly in it um, can be so important and having an artist come in and work with a group of kids um, to design a mural together and maybe mm -hmm. even have the kids be part of painting that um, those things give kids such ownership um, help them learn about careers in the arts are ways to have them engage directly with someone in your community who's doing cool things um, I think I think that those those moments when you find people in the community who are good at engaging with kids and are willing and excited to do it um, who are able to come in and really make connections clear we've had the city archaeologists come in and kids don't know that cities have archaeologists even kids who know what archaeologists are assume they're out you know in Egypt digging um, but this is a historical city, this space that we're in, and there is someone here who's looking for, you know, uh, colonial stuff from the colonial times or stuff from the Wampanoag, um, the local Indian tribe here. So it's been, that was a really special moment where kids both sort of learned that archaeology is something here and something that's happening now, which was really fun and cool, um, but also meant that we were engaging someone from the community. Same with bringing those teens in from the aquarium. Like, these are teenagers who are excited about sea life and who are thinking about careers where they might be a marine biologist or, um, or otherwise working with, with marine animals. And that's an opportunity to get young children sort of knowing what exists in the world for them to do. This is for so many kids, it's, you know, you're a librarian or a teacher or a mailman, but why not also be an archaeologist or a marine biologist? Cool. Um, we had a few more uh, kind of more um, practical questions. Sure. Uh, someone uh, following up, Jenny had a couple follow-ups to the self-check question. Um, first, do you ever get, are there ever lines at them, and is that, does that ever become overwhelming or a problem after, you know, when you have a huge program or something? 
Um, yes, there are definitely sometimes lines, um, and particularly during those times. I mean, we in the mornings here we are <laughs> overwhelmed. I mean, I've had. I remember one morning when when I was talking about that the Friday mornings and how it's very chaotic in here. And um, we had a kid come in, an older kid, I think school was out that day, and look around and come up to me and say, excuse me, ma'am, is there a baby party happening here? <laughs> um, so kids definitely recognize that things are a little nuts. Um, and I think people sort of understand and recognize when there are a lot of people there that yes sometimes it's going to take a, a little more time for services to happen we can also we don't definitely don't require that people check out in the children's room they are welcome to take their materials to other service points and since we are a large a lar this is the central library for the BPL so there are several service points where people can check out materials so that's always an option and we try and make people aware of that when there are lines we haven't especially I mean there's of course there is always sometimes pushback from people who are unhappy um, and we we deal with that with our best customer service and uh, do our best to uh, make them feel like they're welcome to come back and like their needs have been met excellent and then this is a question after my own heart uh, yeah. What are your restrooms like? Do you oh, have a family great restroom? question. Yes, we have two restrooms in the children's room itself, which was, to me, vital. Um, and they are family restrooms. They are single stall. And they have little, one of them has a little tiny toilet and a little tiny sink, and the other one is, is a more regular sized, um, because sometimes we have grown-ups who absolutely will not use the tiny toilet, which I do not blame them for. Um, so yes, we have two family restrooms. We do, we do absolutely say that you can only use them if you are in the children's room with a, with a child, um, so we do keep them just for children's room use. Um, they do have changing tables in them, we, but there are also, on the other side of the floor, there are adult restrooms with five stalls in each. So if there are, that is honestly where we see the most upsetness in lines, is uh, particularly after big programs when everybody's really got to pee um, and those 12 kids really don't want to wait. Um, so it's nice to have the adult restrooms not far in those, in those moments. But we love having the separate restrooms in the space. Um, I think it makes families feel much more like we are meeting all of their needs and, and fulfilling the services that we need to. And you know, it's, the public library can be a scary place for some kids. Like there is, we're a big urban public space where everyone is welcome. And that means that sometimes there are things happening that not everyone wants their kid to be seeing. So we are happy to have a space that might feel like a little bit of an oasis. And again, I don't want to say in any way that, uh, that we are not encouraging everyone to be using the space, but we of course sometimes get feedback from patrons that, uh, that there are people there who they don't want their kid to interact with. And now our feedback as always is that this is a space for everyone, but, um, but we're glad that they can feel safe in the children's space. And to then to clarify, to, to follow up on that, do you, is there some children's rooms have rules about who can be in the actual children's space? Is that, uh, do you have that? Or how yes, we do. Okay. Um, anyone is welcome to browse and look for materials, but um, we do ask that patrons who are not visiting with a child um, take those materials elsewhere in the library to use them, um, and that people not sit and sit and stay unless they are with a child. Um, so we do, and we do get pushback about that sometimes because it is a beautiful, inviting space, but it's also a very busy space, and it is, of course, there for children. So the collections and services are there for everyone, and anyone is welcome to come in and find the book that their three-year-old might need when they get home, but the space is for, is for children and their caregivers. Okay, great. Um, and uh, I'm wondering I, how... How long ago did this did this space transformation happen? Yes. Um, so that's actually a more complicated question than it seems like because the children's and teen, the second floor where the children's teen and um, adult nonfiction is, um, is almost two years old now. Um, that opened in February two years ago. But the rest of the building was not completely renovated until July of this past year, and honestly not really until September because, of course, in construction projects there are some little pieces that don't finish quite on time. So um, as a whole, it's still very new. The children's and teen spaces are almost two years old now, and um, at which has been... Yeah, it's been amazing to see that kids really do use them in the ways that we hoped they would, and um, that 
that spaces and services are still, people are still so excited to come in and we still get feedback about how great it is, which is really gratifying. Um, it's been one of the most amazing experiences of my career to work on this. I honestly can't imagine doing anything that will give me this much joy. Um, the first time, the first kids to use the space, we had a party for the families of the construction workers and designers and architects mm -hmm. to come in and have their kids running around and using the space. And I don't remember the last time I cried that much is when <laughs> all of the children of people who had made this incredible place around us um, got to be the first to, to enjoy it. And I've honestly, even two years later, I still get that feeling watching kids engage in the sensory, on the sensory wall or watching, watching families read together. Um, it's it's really been special. That's great. Um, so it sounds like you're continually evaluating how it's working. Um, I have there been has there been any um, any things that you've had to tweak? I mean, there. I think that in general, the things that we wanted are there, and people are using the spaces in the ways we'd hoped. There are, of course, of course, not everything is going to be perfect. And as I've said, I I have some ambivalence about the tween space. Um, it was done in response to patron feedback and most of the patrons seem to enjoy it and be using it, but it's not my favorite part of the library, so there's that. But there's also things that we knew were not exactly as we wanted. We knew the program space was not as big as we wanted it to be, and that's because we would have had to cut other spaces to make it as big as we wanted it to be. So we just have to find ways to, uh, to make that work for us. We knew that stroller parking was going to be an issue as it is anywhere and I have pictures of that room just literally full of strollers um, um, so there there were things that we knew going in were not going to be perfect and that we might not have the ultimate solution for um, but that we, we would do the best we can um, the other thing that has been a little frustrating and I think there's just no way to make this perfect is things like the sensory wall which are inviting little hands and with the incredible number of little hands we have coming in of course stuff is going to break and that's frustrating when that happens in a new exciting space and um, of course that happens everywhere and we have worked to try and sort of both of course keep it safe but because a lot of those pieces can be swapped out we've been able to still keep it feeling fairly new and inviting um, and that's true in many spaces that uh, that's when you are increasing the number of little hands coming in and tearing at everything around you <laughs> that uh, that usage is going to mean that even two years later we get a little frustrated with how much uh, how much things are starting to go um, right. and I know that that is because the space is being used and loved, so that's part of what I have to remind myself. Um, but in general, I think we have had, I mean, feedback has been almost exclusively good. It's, I mean, there's been very, very little negative feedback, um, and we are still getting excited people coming in and grabbing a handful of calendars to show the other nannies how much is happening here. Terrific. Great. Um, and then finally, what I have, I have a couple, two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, and if I don't see any others on the list here, um, but if anyone has one last minute question, please type it in now. But um, you, when you talked about collecting information about what people were looking for, I'm wondering, um, did, was, did you, you said something about focus groups. Were there other, were there other methods? that you used or mostly focus groups so we did several focus groups um in the teen room we had us we we did have the a teen advisory group who worked pretty closely with us on on the teen room in the children's room we primarily did focus groups but also some sort of informal um get information gathering particularly when like and i i found that as if i was making a decision that i found a little bit difficult and there were a couple of different potential solutions to this problem i would spend a, those couple of days that I had to think about it and go to as many families as I could who used the library and say like, hey, if what would you like to see in your library? Here are some options that we're thinking about. Um, how do you feel like this would work? Um, so I actually found informal feedback to be really useful 
um, and I enjoyed having those conversations and kind of getting to know from my patrons who might not necessarily be willing to go to a focus group what they'd like to see. We also did some things like art projects for kids where they designed their ideal library. Um, so we, we tried to get some kid involvement as well. Of course, when you're talking about in our library, as I said, five and under is kind of our primary group. So it was a lot of like a lot of ladders like in Beauty and the Beast, um, which would be <laughs> fun. But we did, I mean, we got some really fun feedback that way and it was just a way to start conversations with kids so we did try and do some some of that with children as well cool that's great um, and then finally uh, the final question that we're asking all of our presenters um, is why do you do what you do Oh, I do what I do because I love it. Um, I I do what I do because of that feedback that I get from kids. I do what I do because watching kids grow and use the space and become readers and have a joyful feeling about library brings so much joy to me. Um, I do what I do because I love librarians and I think we're guardians of this incredible culture. I do what I do because I think third spaces are so important in our communities and libraries are one of the last truly free third spaces that are open to everyone. I do what I do because I love it and I love kids. Yay! Yeah. All right. These, I, I love hearing these answers. It's wonderful. Um, so thank you very much, Laura, for that great session. Um, I am I'm glad that, that, that you were able to join us today. This was our last session for today, and we oh. hope that you can all join us tomorrow starting at 9 in the morning. And if not, I hope you have a great, um, great rest of your week. Either way, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm going to stop recording.